Welcome, everybody. May I ask you to take your seats? Thank you for coming. And thank you, Ann McNulty, for applauding. <laughs> I'm Walter Isaacson, president of the Aspen Institute. And this is a very special event. It's been 10 years since we started Ideas Festival. And this year, we're going to look ahead 10 years. What's the world going to look like in 2024? And also, for the first time, we're doing 10 days where we're opening with Spotlight Health, because in every single Ideas Festival we've had, there's always been a track on health. And this time, we said, let's make it an entire three-day session. So you're part of something special. Thank you for joining us early. And uh, we hope that this, like an Ideas Fest, will have that spirit of interchange. This is not like other conferences where people get, get up and give talks and then disappear. This is supposed to be deep dive workshops. You're supposed to sit on the grounds here and really talk to people. We're going to have the usual type of thing where we have four tracks. But really, it's going to be all about innovation, new ideas, both in healthcare coverage, healthcare delivery, nutrition, technology, everything else. I, I want to thank our uh, partners at The Atlantic for being with us and helping again. Uh, I've just finished writing a book. The book is about collaboration. And when I think of collaboration, I think of how the healthcare industry is really at the forefront of that. Because you need people in all sorts of fields, people who are designers, people who are scientists, people who are researchers, people who are practitioners. And that ability to work as teams is what's made America's healthcare system good. And we hope in a new age in which everybody has the opportunity to get covered for healthcare, it'll help us be innovative in how we do that. I also want to thank a really good partner. It's not just a sponsoring partner and a foundation partner, but an intellectual partner, and that's the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, they have uh, helped us conceive this whole thing because they have come up with a whole notion of the culture of health. This is not just a holistic approach. It's the notion that health weaves through everything we do, that health is part it's the anchor of a good society. So it's not just about drugs or hospitals or science. It's about provocative discussions of what makes a healthy community. You know, how does design matter to health? How is health related to the economy, to food, to water, to the uh, uh, economic and you know, social opportunities and equality that we need to have in a society? How are we in 2024 going to recognize that health care for all is a good for all of society and all of community? So by working with Robert Wood Johnson and their culture of health, it's helped us shape this whole thing. They're not just the original partners uh, in terms of sponsoring partners, but they were working on this with us even before this thing existed. I hope you'll come back. I'll be here tomorrow. The big thing to understand about all this will be in this tent right here on this stage tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And by the way, I've been assured that being up and ready at 8 a.m. is part of having a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> Uh, but so come back here at 8 a.m. and you won't have to hear me talk about the culture of health, but the people, um, we were just talking about it yesterday evening in our uh, Meadows reception bar, but the culture of health that uh, Robert Wood Johnson has helped conceive, that will be discussed at 8 a.m. in this tent, and that'll really be the intellectual kickoff for what we do, so I really ask that you uh, pay attention and be wide awake for that one. Uh, you're going to see a lot of domestic and global things. One of the things you'll notice, we don't have a separate international track. Uh, you're going to find yourself in conversation in which all of the tracks deal globally, because all issues like that are global. It also is going to be something where you get to do deep dives. This isn't just sit back and listen to panelists. We're going to let you plunge into the complex uh, topics. Health is the biggest thing. It's not only a personal thing for each of us, but it's the biggest thing our businesses and our society and our governments have to deal with. Uh, you know, we pay our taxes. We help support three federal health insurance programs. That was 22% of the federal budget, $772 billion. Uh, but that doesn't begin to explain why we need this interconnected notion of health care. So we'll be looking at the business of health, we'll be looking at health innovations, we'll be looking at health and design, something that I'm particularly interested in, and then living longer, living better, which you can do 
uh, personally to this. A lot of these things are open not only to uh, those of you who have uh, pass holders, but we try to bring the Aspen community in, so there'll be things in town, there'll be a lot of events all over that you can go to both in town and you know around in which uh, people will have bought tickets. But here is the core on this campus. Uh, we'll have 135 speakers from around the world, as well as scholars. Uh, you know, those of you who have been nice enough to buy patrons passes, uh, and those of you who have been our sponsors, you'll know that most of that money goes back to make sure that we have people who can't afford to come here, people who will be the rising stars in this field. So this year, out of the people here, 100 of them are scholars, rising stars from around the world. Uh, who are going to guide us to the year 2024. So um, with that, I want to thank some of the people who put it together. Obviously, Elliot Gerson, my partner, who Elliot runs both our policy programs and our public programs. This is actually a combination of the two. We have a new, public, uh, we have a new policy program that Ruth Katz, who is sitting there, runs, uh, a policy program that Peggy Clark has run for 37 years or something on global health and Katie. Uh, but our policy programs and our public programs joined together to create this. So let me ask uh, Peggy and Ruth to stand up because you're the two who really put it together. And with that, on with the show. Thank you, Walter. Walter, as always, your, your vision helps us reflect on where we've been and where we need to go in the next 10 years to create a healthier world. I'm Britta Stevenson, and I'm the program manager for Spotlight Health. And I have just a few things to share before we move on to our big ideas in health uh, portion of our opening session. For several months now, We've been working hand in hand with a truly remarkable group of Spotlight Health underwriters who contribute not only significant financial support, but notable time on conference calls, many brainstorming sessions that have helped us really create what Spotlight Health is and has become for you the next three days. So the following underwriters, and of course, Walter mentioned the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, they're all notable players in both the domestic and the global health spheres. And they've been wonderfully creative and energetic and most importantly, committed to seeing that the world is a healthier place both here at home and also across the globe in 2024. Our founding underwriters, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We're also joined by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, AARP, the Association of American Medical Colleges, Athena Health, Mount Sinai Health Systems, AdvaMed, Anschutz Medical Campus, Carolina's Healthcare, Genentech, and the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. So Spotlight isn't just about talking about health and healthcare, but it's it's also really getting all of you engaged in your own health. And so over the next three days, there are a lot of fun things that I encourage you to think about and take advantage of on campus. So just to name a few things. You'll see in all of our session venues, there's a healthy zone. And the healthy zone is a taped portion in the back of the room where folks who want to take in sessions standing can do that. Because if you haven't already heard, some consider sitting to be the new smoking. <laughs> we will also have body breaks before our afternoon plenaries, which are just quick five minute yoga stretches, body breaks, because you'll be sitting for several hours by that point. And we encourage you to kind of get the blood flowing and, and get the blood flowing to the brain. We also have uh, picked up the tab, to be totally honest, for all of you to enjoy complimentary we, Cy we Cycle passes while you're here. And We Cycle is a wonderful bike share program 
that uh, launched, I think, a year ago here in Aspen. We have three bike share locations on campus, and I think somewhere around 15 in town. So feel free to pick up your complimentary pass in Dora Hosiery if you're so inclined. And of course, what would health be without exercising your mind? So we encourage you to do that in our campus bookstore, which is uh, in a completely transformed gym space at the far end of campus. And we will have uh, book signings there um, all afternoons, both afternoons, both tomorrow and the 26th. And of course, you've probably heard this from many people, drink plenty of water. Enjoy our healthy food, our snacks, um, and of course, this wonderful setting. It's all part of Spotlight Health, and we're just delighted to have you here. So as you go through each day at Spotlight, we encourage you to think about and maybe even act upon what you hear and learn about during our three days of programming. And to help get us started, we've asked a handful of Spotlight speakers to help jumpstart the big ideas that we want you all to be pushing yourselves to discover while you're here. And even though we're asking them to share big ideas, we've asked them to do it in a very small two minute time frame. And they're all asking, excuse me, answering the same question, which is, what is the one thing that we need to do by 2024 to improve the health of the world? They'll all, they all introduce themselves um, and help get the creative juices flowing. So without any further delay, big ideas in health. I'm Amanda Boxtel, Executive Director of the Bridging Bionics Foundation. Hi, and I'm Scott Summit. I am the Design Director for 3D Systems and a researcher in 3D printing technology. For 22 years of paralysis, I've dreamed of walking again. Statistically, I'm one in 50 of those who are paralyzed in the United States. But the numbers globally are vast. So here's our big idea. What if any individual who has a muscular skeletal challenge can have complete quality of life and freedom of mobility. But let's take it a step further. What if they have the opportunity to, to wear a technology that fits the body seamlessly like a glove and it almost becomes an extension of our senses? So it's the confluence of amazing, versatile, and powerful new technologies that opens new doors and offers new opportunities to people like Amanda and others with complex musculoskeletal challenges. Already, 3D printing, nanotechnology, and robotics are cross-pollinating and creating secondary results we never could have imagined. Now, projecting that into the future 20 years, 10 years, what happens when these are not siloed, individual, discrete technologies, but they fluidly blend and merge together? And then what happens if somebody like Amanda can get an exoskeletal robot that is essentially a second skin, that is dynamic, that is active, that is intelligent, that is powered, and that is 3D printed for her body, specifically tuned to her unique needs. At that point, we'll be seeing a democratization of the access to assistive devices in an entirely new way where people with stroke or limb loss or scoliosis or fracture can be treated with a device like this that will improve their lives in ways never before thought possible. Thank you. That's our big idea. Um, hi, my name is Sam Cass. I am the executive director of Let's Move, First Ladies Let's Move Initiative, and senior policy advisor for nutrition at the White House. All right, the clock's starting. Here I go. Uh, so I think the big idea comes from uh, stop, uh, stop treating the symptoms of all of our challenges and actually investing the vast majority of our resources into the causes of our health issues. 
Um, right now, diet is the number one cause of premature death and disease in our country, outsurpassing everything smoking and everything else. We're losing about nine million years of healthy life due to just diet alone. So what's the answer? How are we going to solve that? I think the big idea that we have is to get uh, our country cooking again. Very simple, and I could really stop now, right? Uh, over the past 40 years, and in, in line with a lot of the health challenges that we're facing, uh, cooking has declined. But when you cook, families eat more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains, less sodium, less fat, less sugar, portion sizes are smaller, calories are down. But what is the barriers that we're facing around uh, cooking? And, and very important to remember that people think that these issues play out around economic lines. Well, poor families who cook have healthier diets than wealthy families who don't. Cooking is the way that we can get healthy, affordable food to everybody's plates. Take oatmeal, for example. I can cook it for 25 cents. The cheapest place you can buy in a restaurant is about $1.50. So the key barriers that we're facing right now, people here cooking, they think uh, dishes, stress, because they don't know how to do it, um, time. What we need to do is make it simple, fun, happy, full of love. So we need to invest the basic skills in our, in our next generation. So they have the, just the fundamental skills to cook a few things. And we need to give the same marketing power of love and happiness and sex that beer and soft drinks get into cooking. <laughs> Done. My name is Krista Donaldson, and I am the CEO of DREV. Um, my background is in product design and mechanical engineering, and my big idea started 10 years ago, but not in healthcare, in electricity reconstruction. I worked for the US government in Iraq, and at the time, the US government had spent over $2 billion on electricity reconstruction, yet in Baghdad, they were hardly seeing eight hours of power. Um, a local shopkeeper at the Al Rashid Hotel in Baghdad, who I had had tea with, um, uttered one of the more memorable quotes of my life. He said, you Americans, you can send a man to the moon, but when I get home tonight, I will not be able to turn on my lights. How do you ensure technology reaches users? How do you put it in their hands so that it is useful? These are the questions that drive us at DREV. Um, DREV is short for Design Revolution, and we design products that improve the lives of people living on less than $4 a day. Um, one of the areas that we've been focused on is medical devices. And while it may not be obvious that there are similarities between Iraq's grid and medical devices, there are. Despite the advanced technology and despite the good intentions, they're not reaching the people who need them most. DREV's first two products are now in almost 20 low-income countries. Um, over 20,000 babies have been treated by Brilliance, our phototherapy device to treat severely jaundiced newborns. Over 6,000 patients are wearing the Remotion knee. This is a prosthetic knee for above-knee amputees. But the demand is much greater than what we are starting to serve at DREV. In December, I gave a TED Women talk, and um, it was about the knee, and even we were surprised by the inquiries that came into DREV. We had over 250 requests from the knee from around the world, and we had over two dozen from Americans in the United States. My big idea for the one thing we need to improve uh, the health for people um, by 2024, and I hope we can do it sooner, it's to close the gap between good intentions and the patients who need life-saving solutions. The science is critical, and we need to focus on translating, translating this research and these findings into affordable, high-quality solutions that will save lives and cure patients. Thanks. Good afternoon, my name is Eva Fattorini. I'm a doctor and I'm a chair of Arts and Medicine Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm originally from Croatia, I reside in Abu Dhabi right now and commute between the United States and Abu Dhabi. Um, so my big idea for 2024 started with two small people, my kids. 
few years ago, I took them to see the musical performance, the dance performance we organized for our patients in the main lobby of the hospital. And they were completely mesmerized. They were three years old. And then a few months later, we spoke about it, and um, we talked about a hospital and asked them, do you know what a hospital is? And they looked at me, they blinked with their little eyes and said, yes, that's the place where people dance. So, so little girls gets out of the hospital with leukemia. She's fortunately in remission. And then a few months later, she comes to her mother and says, I'm not feeling well, I want to go back to the hospital. And her mother got scared. She checks her temperatures and you know, everything is fine. She says, why would you want to go to the hospital? And she says, because I want to see the painting lady. And the painting lady was our art therapist. The General Hospital in India, South India, which sees 2,000 underprivileged patients a day. We brought musical performances, live musical performances there. So every week they have it. The patients come to the windows, they watch, those who can't walk, they watch the performances. You know, we live in an era of imminent social explosion where we need to focus on things that connect us as humans. And there is probably nothing that connects us more than two things. Two things that transcend any material value and no limits in cultural, religious or language barrier, arts and health. As I speak right now, there are more than 300,000 registered hospitals in, in the world, probably more than that, in between 10 and 15 million doctors, nurses. As I speak right now, there are millions of patients around the world whose hospital and hospital becomes home for them. What is our responsibility to do? To infuse these places with the energy and vitality of the arts. To think about arts, medicine and architecture as intersection where we can create these places where kids in 2024 can answer the questions what the hospitals are with a smile on their face and say that's the place where people dance. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tony Fauci and I'm the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. And my big idea relates to what I've been doing for the past 33 years, and that is being involved with the HIV AIDS pandemic. 33 years ago, the first cases were reported. I became involved in that uh, when there were about 50 people who were reported. And so what is my big idea? My big idea is that we can end the AIDS pandemic in the next 10 years, and let me tell you why. But first, the numbers. There were less than 50 patients who reported when I got involved. Now, 70 million people have been infected, 36 million dead, 35 million living with HIV, and more than 2 million infected each year. In the United States alone, there are 1.1 million people infected and over 650,000 deaths. So how do I have the temerity to be here with you and give you a big idea that in 10 years we're gonna end that. It really relates to the issue that biomedical research has provided us with the tools of prevention and treatment in a way that we can do that. And let me tell you how. Unlike other viral infections, which generally come, you get infected, you're infected for a week, you either die or you get better, and you infect people in a short window. With HIV, you're viremic for years and years, so you have the opportunity to continually infect people. With treatment, you can actually bring the level of virus to below the point where it would be extremely difficult to transmit it. So if you look at the data, if you treat infected mothers who are pregnant, who would usually transmit to their baby 25 to 35 percent of the time, in fact it goes down to less than 1 percent. You decrease by 96 to 98 percent transmission sexually if you just treat the person that's infected. The concept is called treatment as prevention. So we already today have the capability of treating people if we go out, seek out, voluntary test, put into care and treat. In fact, mathematical models say that within 10 years, we can do it. So it's up to us to do it. Our generation is unfortunate enough to have witnessed this pandemic. Let us be the generation that can witness the end of the pandemic. Thank you. Watson and Crick uh, created a revolution in healthcare. 
But what if the next Watson were living in a slum in Kampala? And what if the next Crick perhaps were manning a ski lift here in Aspen? How would they meet? How would, how would the next big thing happen? My name is Mishkin Ingavle. In 2008, I co-founded a company called Biosense. We use mobile devices to take healthcare to people. For example, uh, one of our uh, devices is called UCheck. It's powered by Android, and it makes urine and blood testing possible in very, very remote locations in India. So hundreds of clinics and labs right now uh, diagnose diabetes and other big problems using this kind of technology on mobile. I believe there are hundreds or thousands of such great ideas out there. Best ideas could come from a surgeon in London. They could come from our friend in Kampala we know of. They could come from anybody, you. What if the best ideas from the best people could be submitted online and could be collaboratively worked on in real time by designers, engineers, makers, surgeons, regulators, investors? What if these ideas could actually get to action, not be wasted? This kind of thing seems like Kickstarter meets Wikipedia meets Quirky.com for healthcare. But it could happen. <laughs> We've started, in a small way, I've started this uh, as a nonprofit in India. Uh, we have uh, brought on board multiple partners from private and public sector. If it does work, if it does work, then global health and development will actually work. Thanks a lot. Good evening. I'm Harvey Feinberg. I'm president of the Institute of Medicine in Washington, DC. My big idea is in 10 years to create a vaccine that will eliminate the threat of influenza in the world. Every year, influenza causes severe illness in an estimated 5 million people. And every year, year in and year out, a half a million people die from influenza. Every once in a while, there's a great outbreak, a pandemic, which can produce millions more deaths. How many of you have ever had a flu vaccine? Raise your hands. Congratulations. Most of you have had it. Here's the bad news. It only lasts one year. It's not really all that effective. Only about 60 to 65% effective, and in older people, maybe a little less. And it takes a while to produce it every year. If you have a pandemic that started, you don't want to wait six months before you can get your vaccine. Why do we have this problem? Because the current vaccines are only good against the changeable coat of the virus. What we need is a vaccine that will attack the conserved proteins on the virus, be available all year round, used once, lasting protection, be safe, be effective, be affordable, be universally available. And if we put our minds to it, we can build on the prototypes that already exist, and we can create a universal, effective, safe, widely available influenza vaccine that can eliminate the threat of influenza for the human populations everywhere in the world. That's my big idea. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Neeraj Mistry. I'm with the Global Network for Neglected Tropical Diseases at the Sabin Vaccine Institute. I'm proudly South African, but I've been living on the East Coast for the past um, 12 years of my life. Uh, so my big idea, and I think it sort of links to the whole issue of culture, how do we actually change that cultural mindset, is LWL. Uh, Can everyone say after me LWL? Perfect. And, and like all cultural shifts, it's usually there's a story behind it. 
So with neglected tropical diseases, the work that I do is actually addressing the plight of the poorest billion and a half people in the world. And these are people infected by parasites. And because of that, children can't go to school, mothers are unhealthy and, and uh, are at risk during delivery, fathers are not as productive in the workplace as they could be, and there's generalized uh, a poverty, a poverty trap that we face. But by providing interventions, what we're doing is we're affording people a better quality of life, a life worth living. And here's what happened to me when I started working for the poorest billion people. It made my life worth living. It's through the empathic connection that we actually have with people who don't have what we have that actually gives us uh, recourse and a moment of pause to examine our own lives. And if we had to do that with every single thing that we did every day to say, what makes our lives worth living? We'd be able to assess what health interventions we need, what quality of life we need, uh, w whether we need to live longer or to live better. And that's the kind of cultural mindset that we have to, to move toward. So given that we live in a three-letter acronym world of LOL and OMG, LWL represents this. Can you imagine someone texting, oh, I had a wonderful conversation with, um, with my mom today, LWL. Or we saved a whole lot of children who can now go to school, LWL. I met this person on the plane and had a wonderful conversation with them, LWL. And if we look at this life worth living and use that as our lens for, for being more connected, we'll definitely be healthier and more importantly, we'll be happier. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael Murphy. I'm the executive director and founder of Mass Design Group. And my big idea is to change architecture to radically improve our lives and radically improve our health. We want to change the definition of architecture to improve our health. How are we going to do this? I think we can do this in two ways. First, we build influential architecture that shows improvements in health and affects policy globally. And secondly, we train the next generation of architects to think about the role of architecture in improving health. And where do we start? We start with the most vulnerable communities. Take the continent of Africa, for example. In the continent of Africa, seven of the 10 fastest growing economies are here. And the most rapidly urbanizing cities are also gonna be in Africa over the next 30 years. And yet in the entire continent of Africa, there are 1,200 licensed architects and planners when you take out the major cities of uh, Nairobi and Lagos and Cairo and Johannesburg. Compare that to Italy, which has 120,000 licensed architects and planners today, a hundredfold the amount. What happens when our cities that are growing are not designed? Epidemic outbreaks of cholera, cholera for example, have emerged in places like Port-au-Prince and Haiti. Uh, new strands of diseases like multidrug resistant tuberculosis are emerging in hospitals uh, because they weren't designed to deal with infection control. And of course, one billion people are living in slums currently, which will only increase fourfold as the population of the subcontinent increases over the next 50 years. Our organization has started to address this in Rwanda, where we started a fellowship program uh, to train the next generation of African architects. When I got there in 2008, there were eight licensed architects working in the country. Now the first school of architecture has trained the first 25. And next year, the next 25 uh, will be complete. So 58 architects now, some of them working with us today. Our goal over the next 10 years is to increase this 100-fold. Having 100 design architects working with us focused on health and the built environment and how design can improve the lives of those around us. So what I want to leave you with today is next time you look at architecture, think not what architecture is, but what architecture does. And if we ask what architecture does, we can then ask what architecture can do to improve our health. Thank you very much. My name is Jane Otai, and I'm a New Voices Fellow at the Aspen Institute. And uh, my big idea today is a secret technology that can be able to, ad to address issues of climate change, global economy, food security, and a host of other challenges 
that we face in this world. And does anybody, can anybody guess what this technology could be? <laughs> well, it's not that. It's simply family planning. Okay? I, I work in uh, the slums of Nairobi, and I work with women and girls. And for those women and girls who have been able to access family planning, they are able to delay their first pregnancies and be able to complete their education. Women are able to engage in economic activities and better their own life and the life of their children. And we've also realized that with family planning, we are able to reduce maternal mortality rates and infant mortality rates. And this is true for all of us in the world. Because with family planning, there is less stress on the environment. Okay? There is better management of the food that we have. And we have stronger families which are built on stronger finances. So we all have a stake in this. From Nairobi to Aspen, we can make family planning accessible to women. And it's not expensive. That's the beauty of it. Family planning is not expensive. We don't need new innovations or new infrastructures. We simply need dedication and determination to make family planning available to women who want it. And this is possible. And all we need is just to get committed to ensuring that all women who need it have it. So my big idea is family planning for a healthier planet. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Grant Verstandig. I'm the founder and CEO of Audex Health. I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist, um, but I am a consumer. So a really quick show of hands, how many people in this room consume healthcare every year? How many people in this room go to Starbucks at least once a week? Isn't it bizarre you have more choice at Starbucks than you do in your health every year? Literally, right now we have three products on an exchange, bronze, silver, and gold. That's like going to Starbucks and someone saying you have black coffee, coffee with sugar, or coffee with cream. Um, my mom goes to Starbucks every day. She would never make it through that process. Those of you who know her know that's true. But imagine a world where you actually had choice in your health care, and there was not a bronze, silver, or gold plan, but a grant plan. And you could take something like this healthy eating infrastructure and say, hey, if you cook at home, I'll lower your premium. If you get a flu vaccine, I'll lower your premium. If you, can, if you know somebody with HIV and you can help get them into a prevention treatment module, I'll lower your premium. You could actually flip health and every amazing idea you've heard and flip it on its head and make it real because right now as a consumer, we actually have no control over our health. Someone chooses it for us and when we do get to choose, like in an exchange, we have three choices. So imagine a world 10 years from now, we didn't have three choices, but we had, in the US at least, 315 million choices, and it was changing every single year. It's my big idea, thank you. I didn't think I could possibly even be more excited about the next three days, but these 11 speakers in front of me have left me kind of tingling all over. So they are a snapshot, a spotlight, on the 137 speakers who have joined us over the next three days. So if I have one thing to ask of all of you while you're here, it's to, it's to challenge yourself. Go to sessions that you know nothing about. Go to sessions where you might kind of be rubbed the wrong way. That's okay. And it's that pulling and stretching that makes us Think about the big ideas that maybe we hadn't necessarily kind of tapped into before that. So to build off of Sam's um, request that we all cook more, I invite you all to join us at our welcome reception over in the Door Hosier Center. It is a feast of local um, food and beverages. We've really tried to get all of our um, wine and alcohol, and all of our food sources from Colorado. And I, I'm thrilled to have you all here. 
So welcome to the 2014 Aspen Ideas Festival, our kickoff. Welcome to Spotlight Health. Enjoy. Shine. 